Hi guys, this is the video for Lab 6 on kinetics. In lecture, you should be close to this or at least have the material. If not, there's content on Blackboard for you. Now, in lecture, you guys are going to get into a lot of detail with kinetics. You're going to talk about the in, uh, the integrated rate laws, how do you work with the rate laws, in a lot more detail um, than here. Here we're going to be just kind of covering the basics, you know, how do you monitor a reaction rate, how do you determine the rate of a react, the order of a reaction, and then just some uh, general things with me mechanisms. So reaction rate is a important factor in a lot of reactions and it's because just because a reaction is useful doesn't mean it happens quickly. You may want to slow it down, you may want to speed it up, but you need to be able to adjust that. So in lecture you'll talk about how you can uh, speed up a reaction by increasing reactants, um, by adjusting the temperature and that kind of thing. But here what we're going to do is more talk about how is it monitored. And so the idea is the easiest way to monitor a reaction rate, to calculate a reaction rate, is to look at the concentration of a reaction, reactant or a product. And that's just because we can't see at the molecular level, we can't see the collisions, we can't see something like that. But we can monitor, you know, how much product we have at a given period of time. This is especially true if you have a product that is forming a colored uh, solution. Um, you know, in a couple weeks you'll do a lab where you make some iron thiocyanate and that has a nice reddish color so you'll watch the solution go from clear colorless to clear red. Um, and it's a matter of you can actually see that. So here we're going to be looking at reactants and products but we're going to do this with paper. We used to do this with chemical labs and the the problem is um, one, the materials were not always the, the safest and then two, you guys know in lab things don't always work and so it could be kind of confusing. So we're going to start off with just uh, some paper and we're going to look at a reaction similar to this where we have A plus B forming some product. Now when you have a, any kind of reaction like this, the rate law is always going to be equal to the rate times this uh, rate constant K times the concentration of your reactants each raised to an exponent. So here I've got A to the X and B to the Y. Now these exponents are actually determined experimentally. They are not determined by any other method. You have to use your experimental data here. Now if we were to talk about the rate here, we could talk about the rate in terms of either of these reactants disappearing. So the rate of reaction is equal to the decrease in A uh, per period of time. We could also talk about it in terms of, uh, you know, C here. Now, depending on the type of reaction, it could be zero order, first order, or second order. Now, the order just refers to the exponent in that rate law expression. So if rate is equal to K times the concentration of A raised to some exponent, if A is raised to the zero, it makes it a one, so rate is just equal to K. If rate is equal to KA to the one, it's just equal to rate, uh, rate is just equal to K times the concentration of A. Rate, uh, for a second order, it would be rate equals the K times the concentration of A squared. Now, there's a couple ways of determining the order. The easiest is to take experimental data over time and graph it and you can usually see that, um, let me see if I can end show. You can set the integrated rate law equal to y is equal to mx plus b and so if you have your y for this guy, your a at some time is equal to minus kt um, and then plus a0, okay? Um, now 
the idea here is you can see that a linear graph is going to have uh, for, I'm sorry let me start that again for a zero order reaction the linear graph would be concentration versus time for the first order reaction it's going to be the natural log of concentration versus time and then for second order it's one over concentration versus time and so with that in mind you can really start to adjust um, what you're how you're going to be treating your data okay now in general we are just going to be dealing with very simple reactions A going to B or A plus B going to C or A going to B and then that D, uh, going to C and so we can look at both the hmm, there we go um, a simple reaction like this or we can go into something more complicated where we have a two-step process and so here we could even talk about the rate of reaction here where we could monitor um, the rate of this reaction where we have we can look at just this step right here where A goes to B and we could look at it either as you know monitor you know the the way that the concentration of each reactant will change and so like here you know we have A going to B and so the rate we just said was equal to the change in A over time. It's negative because A is disappearing. Now that could also be, you know, the um, the the rate law itself. We can plug that in. Um, but we could also even monitor the rate of production of our product here. And so there's a lot of things going on. Now here we actually have a two-step process. And so in order for this to happen, we have to have a going to B and then once we have B, B would be able to react to form C. And so you have two steps. Now if K, this first step is really, really fast, what's going to end up happening is you'll have B forming very, very quickly and A disappearing very, very quickly. But then um, over time, it'll take a lot longer time for C to appear. Now if K2 is much faster and K1 is a slow process, then it'll take a while for B to produce, but as soon as we get B, it'll immediately move on to produce our C. And so the idea is the slowest step is our rate determining step here. And so we can kind of see how the concentrations versus time is are going to change. And it is really just a matter of evaluating data here more than anything else. Now, for this experiment, it seems overly uh, simple, but the directions can be kind of convoluted. And so I want to walk you through how this is going to work. Now, in general, you're going to have, well, let's pull up our directions. You're going to have an experimental setup just like this, where you have your three piles of paper, and you're going to start with your reactant and try to see how much of your product is going to form. And so if we go up here, A is going to B and then B is going to, uh, oops, wrong one, A is going to B and then B is going to C. And so as we do this, we have to keep this kind of mechanism in mind. Uh, now, in general, <laughs> these directions work pretty good but they're kind of hard to understand until you see it and so I want to walk you through how this is going to look in lab and so the idea is this actually tells you to roll for each piece of paper so I'm going to show you how I'm going to set up my desktop um, and then you can kind of decide from there so it tells us to start with our 10 pieces of A so because you're going to have five dice die five die uh, rather than the I think the the one it says or two it says we actually were able to manage we were able to track down all five so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna roll five dice at a time and I'm gonna evaluate them accordingly now the dice you get or the die you get are all different colors and so it's gonna be kind of easy to monitor which one goes where for me to make sure that I'm not 
non-objectively controlling the which dice goes where. I generally make a list, so we're going to move that down. I think you have a red one, a yellow one, a green one, a blue one, and a white one. Um, that may vary, but I usually write it down in some kind of order. Kind of like that. Um, and even without even thinking about it, I just did Roy G. Biv as close as I possibly could anyway. And so for me, I don't have the colored die here. I only have um, the electronic ones. And so I'm just going to say every time you roll the dice, you would put the red one, the yellow one, the green one, the blue one, the white one, and you would evaluate the corresponding position. Um, here, mine is already done for me uh, because... I don't know that's how it is so let's get rid of that for a minute so um, now let's go back to the directions for a second it's gonna be my second attempt here <laughs> using dice live is not um, always gonna give the best results so here I've got my experimental setup I've got my 10 pieces of a paper and I'm going to line up my dice with red yellow green blue and white I'm going to use different rules from the ones that you guys have uh, just to try and make sure you see the most complicated situations. Uh, so here we have all A, so I'm not going to even worry about B for the moment. If I roll 1 through 3, a reaction happens. 3 to 6, it doesn't. Okay. Now, let's go ahead and pull up our dice and we're going to roll all 5. Now looking at the rules, I'm going to line this up. So this is my red dice, my yellow, my green, my blue, my white. Now I'm going to read my rules again. If it's one through a three, I leave it alone. I'm only going to have a reaction if it's three to six. Uh, oh, sorry, this should be a four to six. Let's make it a little bit easier. Um, so now looking at our rules, I'm going to say wherever there's a one to a three, I'm going to leave it alone. I'm only going to mess with it for a 4 to a 6. So here we've got too many windows. Um, no reaction, no reaction, no reaction, no reaction. Only this one has reacted. So I'm going to move that over and replace it um, with a B. Okay. So here we cannot record data yet. We have to do it for the whole, all 10. So we're going to go again to um, our dice and we're going to roll. Okay, so again, one through three, no reaction happens. No reaction occurred here, 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 here. They're all two to three. So this is my first timestamp. So I'm going to come over and record that I have, now I have 9A, 1B, and 0C. So that's my first timestamp. Now we're going to do it again, okay? So I'm going to roll five dice, but here, just remember where your dice line up. So you're going to roll and then red, yellow, green, blue, white, or whatever you decide to do. As long as you're doing consistently each time, it won't matter. So let's roll our five dice. Now, we know for the A's, and I usually do it step by step, everywhere I have an A, 1 through 3 does not happen. I'm only a 4 through a 6 causes that. So again, pulling up our dice, this works. That's the only A that reacted here, okay? So this one, oops, gets taken to the discard pile. This one comes over here. Now we evaluated the A, but we need to look at the B. The B, this is a 5. So what do the rules say about B? For a B, no reaction happened. 2 to a 6, no reaction. It only occurs with a 1. So no reaction. So now let's roll for our second timestamp. Roll again. These are all A's. Um, so only the reaction only happens when you have four to six. So here, here, and here. A 
Okay, so this is my second timestamp. I have five and five, so I'm going to go over to my data section. Five, five, zero. Now we can look at our, we're going to roll for our third timestamp. Now for this, this is a B, so we have to look at the rules for B. B, a reaction only happens if you get a 1. So for this one, I'm going to move it so that you guys can maybe see it the whole time. There we go. Um, and we'll put it directly over. So this reaction happened, so I'm going to put this back, pull over my C. This reaction did not, that is not a 1. For my A's, it only happens if it's 4 to 6, so this one is the only one that reacted here. Okay, so now let's go to our second row. Here, B only reacts with a 1, that doesn't work. This only reacts 4 to 6, that one doesn't, but this one does. Okay, so then the next one. The B's, the last two B's only react when it is a 1, so not yet. Um, so we are done here. So let's rep record our next timestamp. So this is 3. One, two, three, four, five, six, and one. So let's do two more timestamps and then I'm going to show you how to do the graphs here. So now we're going to roll again. And I still roll all five just because um, I don't want to have to worry about lining it up or anything. C can't react, so we're going to ignore that. This is a B, so it only reacts if we roll a one. It That didn't happen. This reacts four to six. It did, so we are going to move this over and replace it with a B. Alright, so then our next one, B, only reacts with a 1, nope, and this one, this A re did react. Okay, so then for our next row, if we go to our rules, just to reaffirm, B occurs if you have only a 1, A is uh, 4 to 6. So looking at wrong window, there we go. Our B here did not react. This A did. It's a 4. Oops. For this one, B reacts if you hit roll a 1, so we can get rid of that. This is a 4, no reaction. This is a 1, so it did react. Okay. So we're going to go to our data. We've rolled for all 10. Now we have 0, 7, and 3. And so at this point it becomes kind of easy to, to do it because you just roll and you look for a 1. So for our first thing, uh, this guy right here is the only one we have. So we're going to move him over to the discard pile. Bring in a C. That's it. Next row. Only the third one has a 1 and that's not able to react. It's a C, so no big deal. So again, we have now 0, 6, and 4. I'm going to do one more. Why not? Okay. Um, yeah. So we're going to roll. Again, we're only looking for one here, here, and here. Nope. Roll for the next set. This one does. So we pull it over. So our next timestamp is um, 5 and 5. 0, 5, and 5. Kind of like that. Now at this point, we have enough data. I'm not going to continue all the way to the end um, because you should have a good idea here. But the point is you would continue until you have only C. 
Ideally, it only takes 10, uh, 15 or so rolls, but you may need more. You need to go all the way to the end just to make sure your graphs are going to be really good. Now, once you have that, we're going to actually graph these using uh, the, the data that we have. So just to graph the experimental data, I'm just going to highlight and we are going to insert this. Um, you did have some experience with your graphing lab on how to do this. Um, I can never remember where the good one is. There it is. And so here we've got concentration of A versus time, where this is concentration in number or number of paper, and then this is time in rolls. And so you can kind of see this. Now, the idea is you're going to graph the concentration versus time for these in A, but then in B, you're actually going to determine the order of reaction by graphing concentration versus time, natural log of concentration versus time, and um, one, uh, one over concentration versus time. And the idea here is the graph that is most linear is going to be the the one that is that, that's going to show your your order. And so here, for example, I'm just going to go ahead and get rid of this one, um, and we're going to make a trend line. Add trend line, and you want to display both the equation and the r squared value. Now this is for part A. This you're actually going to do this for part B, but I want to just make sure we show you what it's going to look like. For time, um, now you're going to end up having a, a lot more data for B, but that's okay. I just want to show you what you're going to compare. You're going to insert your graph. Um, actually, sorry, that's for A. Uh, so that's concentration versus time. Now we need to do the natural log of concentration. If you haven't done this, it's um, equals and then up here with the formula sheet, I usually just type in LN and come on computer. There it goes. Okay. Of this equals and then we're going to drag it down. Now, so what we can do here is highlight it, just um, highlight it only until you get to the undefined. And then we're going to graph this, insert. You can already tell this is not going to be linear, but that's okay. Now I'm going to go ahead, I'm not going to label these axes, but what I do want to do is include your trend line. And again, you want to have both the equation and the R squared value on the graph. So now let's do one over concentration. So I'm going to say equals one divided by, and then I'm going to click on the concentration of A. And again, you guys will have more, more data here, but um, it is what it is. Insert this. This is one over A versus, that's not an A. <laughs> it's still not an A. Versus time. And again, we're going to do a trend line. Now, Technically, you could look at these and be like, oh, well, they're, none of them are really great. But you want to look to see which one is most linear. And the way you do that is by looking at that R squared value. We have a linear trend line, so the one that's got the R squared value closest to 1 is the one that's most linear. 0.89, eh. 0.94, eh. 0.97 is really not that great either. But here, this is concentration of A is versus time is the most linear for my data, 
which means technically I would go into my rate law and say, well, concentration versus time is for a zero order. So this reaction must be zero order with respect to A based off that trend line. Okay. Um, so as you're going into your data for B, make sure that you're really considering those trend lines, concentration versus time, natural log versus time, and one over concentration versus time. That is what is going to give you the information you need to really find the order there. In terms of this, this um, part for part C is just a, an, an equation. So if you look in your data section, I mean, in your direction section, there we go. The idea is the you double the concentration, concentration raised to some exponent is going to be equal to this fraction. You can either do it on the calculator or you can experiment, but it should be, you're going to end up rounding to zero, one, or two. Okay. So hopefully this will help you kind of see how do you see order from a graph, how do you deal with that order when you're writing your rate law, and that sort of thing.